This is my first brown bag presentation um, and also attending at STG. And so I wasn't quite sure what to expect. This format is quite different from I guess what I had imagined. I was telling Jen when I walked in, I was surprised by the rows of tables and so many chairs out. I was expecting a conference room and maybe like six seats. <laughs> and we'd have this very casual lunch and talk about change management or whatever we, our kids or families or whatever. So, um, so if I sound a little nervous, because I am I'm not used to being in front of a large group or even a small group of people. So anyway, so bear with me. Um, and uh, just to break the ice, I really wanted to get a sense of who you were before we got started. You all read about what the topic was, was unchanged management, and I wanted to get a kind of an idea of who you are. I really don't, I think it's my, aside from Jen, which I've interacted with over email. <laughs> Everyone else, I think, um, I've not really met formally, so we don't have to go through uh, everyone, but just wanted to get a sense of who you are and why you're here, why you would be attending a brown bag presentation on change management. So you're looking at me, so I'm going to <laughs> point to you and, uh, and ask who you are and why you're here. I am, I'm Julie, and I'm a software developer for oh, okay. Full Stack Developer. Okay. And really interested in some of the processes that you use to manage software development projects. And oh, nice. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah, for us, we're just having a challenge managing a change of action. Okay. Terrific. Are you also, sorry, I didn't catch it. Are you also software? Okay, terrific. So I'm going to take on someone in the back, back there. <coughs> My name's Jacob, and I'm also a software developer. Um, I mostly came here to kind of um, understand how the change manager works. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Terrific. So, I mean, it sounds like most of you are familiar, have some familiarity with change management. Um, some of you may be here because you like the lunches that they serve at Brown Bag. Um, anyone here because they are they work they're with a client who has a pretty strong uh, change management office or dis discipline established? Okay, gives me a good idea where, where we're at. Um, so a little bit about me, again, I'm Jen Adams. I'm a project manager. I've been with STG um, almost four years now, so about three and a half. Um, I've had one client uh, my entire time with STG, and that's Science Bank Corporation. I support the accounting and finance uh, program, but I'm also with their enter enterprise technology office, so which means mainly working on financial applications. Okay, um, quite a departure from what I was doing before. Uh, my past life before STG, I was in advertising and marketing. I've held various positions within the project management group, from technical project manager way to uh, managing full programs and teams of project managers. And um, I'm also Scrum certified and I um, just joined the Association of Change Management Professionals. So to tell you a little bit about um, why I'm here, um, I just recently attended a conference, Change Management Conference. Um, it was hosted by Association of Change Management Professionals. Um, the conference was in Universal Studios Orlando. Um, that's not why I picked this conference. Um, the reason I picked this conference is because, as I explained, I've been a project manager for a lot of years. And when you think about attending, um, when you think about professional development, or attending another conference, you get to a point in your career where you just cannot take any more, you know, breakout sessions or textbooks on project management. You know, it just gets to a point where you're like, 
I don't think I can go to a classroom, another class on project management, and really expect to learn anything new. So I really wanted to see where else I could take uh, my experience in project management, you know, what's another path, what's another layer um, um, on top of project management. And change management was, uh, was actually a really great opportunity, and I thought this was a really great opportunity for me to learn um, about change management. And um, what I want to do in this session was to um, share with you what I've learned um, at this conference. They covered a wide range of topics around change management, from neuroscience of change, um, basically how our brain works, and how we respond to change, all the way to more complex um, methodology sessions on change man management, whether it be waterfall or agile. So it got, um, it can, it got, they got very deep into change management processes. They had speakers um, from um, all across the industry um, at the enterprise level, Pricewaterhouse, Accenture, Southwest Airlines. Um, they had a lot of um, really great authors who um, written a lot on team dynamics and change management. And um, the other interesting part, I got to, you know, you are at these sessions, you get a chance to network. And I was really surprised by kind of the variety of um, professions represented um, at this conference, engineers, uh, people from HR, um, IT, of course, project management, and software development. So um, what I will not cover, again, I'm very new to change management as well. So this was the, uh, the purpose of attending this conference is for me to learn. So I won't be able to go very deep into change management tools, methodologies, or like complex algebraic formulas and things like that that they shared. Um, you know, you can only consume and remember so much in a three-day period. And I certainly won't lecture for 60 minutes, and, and I won't uh, unfortunately have all of the answers, but I was really hoping we could have a good dialogue around change management. Um, sounds like a lot of you are familiar or have experience or want to have, um, are very much in, interested in um, implementing stronger change management discipline within your organizations. So what I will talk about in this uh, brown bag, um, some guiding principles of change management. Um, so depending on your Google search, you know, you, there's a lot of literature out there around change management. And there could be three, there could be 10, there could be 20. So I'm going to talk about five in this, in this session. Um, and because I'm a project manager, I really wanted to talk more about the difference between project management and change management. Um, they actually had a lot, several sessions on this topic. And I think it's because there can be, I think people can see that there would be some crossover. And I, I look at Celestia because we've had a lot of conversations around how there may be crossover between a business analyst and a project manager, right? And we've had a lot of conversations around that. Now the conversation shifts to project management and change management and crossovers there. And um, so there are differences, but there are also really great ways that we can work together and complement each other, just as business analysts and project managers can really complement each other. The, it's, uh, you know, if we have a good understanding of our roles. Um, and then finally, I really wanted to share with you um, some case studies um, from um, some of the speakers where they've had, where they have very strong centralized change management office and what they were able to implement successfully within their organization. It was really impressive the difference it can make to at the enterprise level um, with a strong change management group. So um, let's start with a quiz. <laughs> um, change management is from a, B, C, and D. I don't know if you can all see the screen. Any guesses on what change management is? It's a new discipline. Not many people know about it, especially executive management. 
It's really easy to implement once you have the right strategy, tools, and processes. It's not true for everything if you have the right strategy, tools, and processes, and people. You can implement anything. Uh, change management focuses on people and engagement. It's something else that I didn't list here. Any guesses? I should have brought a prize because that would have like <laughs> encouraged you to answer these questions. Go ahead. All of the above. All of the above. Okay. Any other guesses? E. E. Easy to implement. Okay. I su surprised you with by that answer, but <laughs> any other guesses? Okay. C, focus on people engagement. So I like to throw out these quizzes where there's not really a right or wrong answer, right? Because it'd be kind of embarrassing, right, if you posted something that was wrong. Um, I would say it really, the answer to what change management is, um, is a matter of perspective. It really depends on um, who you are, what you do, and where you are as well it has different meaning for everyone. Formerly, if you were to look it up, and like there's a professional dictionary, change management is the discipline that guides how we prepare, equip, and support individuals to successfully adopt change in order to drive organizational success and outcomes. So formally as a discipline, that's how change management is defined. But again, it has different meaning for everyone. So if you're in IT, change management may mean um, how do I um, maintain a system, right? How do I maintain this change uh, once it goes into effect? From a UX perspective, it may be, well, we're paying attention. How does experience for our customer or end user change and how do we manage that, right? And for developers, it may be, how do we manage the change throughout the whole development process? For project managers, it may be, we implement this product. How do we ensure that this is successful in adoption? And for sales, how do we manage the change to our customers? So it really has a different meaning. Um, really depends on who you are, um, what you do, and again, where you are at. Um, if your organization has a very strong centralized change management office, right? It may be uh, it may be uh, very straightforward in terms of how you implement change management. If you're very new, it's, there's not a strong culture or office around change management. It may be where you start thinking about more role-based change management. So. If you want to make enemies, try to change something. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Who has had experience with this? Yeah? Do you want to share? Uh, I did project management for a newspaper company. And oh. we go in and switch people from their old publishing system to the new one. Mm -hmm. If you can get journalists angry at you, it just try to change a little bit of their day. And yeah, you can really make people angry. <laughs> so it's interesting that there is such an interest in change management because we also know that there's a lot of resistance to change and you take a lot of risks when you say, when you come in and say, hey, I really um, think change management would be really great for our organization or change management is a really important process for this, pro uh, for this project, right? Um, but change is a necessity in every business, in every industry. I mean, we wouldn't be here, right, working in technology if it wasn't, if we weren't the type of people that really embrace change, right? Um, it's really essential to our society. Um, but the change may be, again, really different depending on who you are and what you, and, and the organization. Um, the resistance to change, maybe a new content management system, right? I've had experiences with that, definitely. Try to you know, go from um, a PHP-based content management system to a .NET. You know, you have IT and you have the developers, you have clients just incredibly frustrated with the proposed change. Um, reporting tools may be uh, a difficult change depending on um, 
for people who are actually using the reporting tool. People who want to implement it may see it as an opportunity to maybe save money, save time, but the end users may see it as this is going to change how I run my report and do I still get all the data that I need. Um, my experience with one change is project management tools. I work for an organization where there's been a testing of various tools because we are looking forward to a change in current tools or lack of tools, right? We've explored Workfront, Jira, Rationale, JAMA, Azure more recently and um, rather at this point than choose one and force change onto the project managers and business analysts, we're using all of them. <laughs> so you can see why change management may be an important process to, um, to integrate to an organization where rather than force change and implement one tool, just embrace all of the tools and use all of it. So um, another important one in terms of change may be um, reorganization of, uh, of management or departments and I know that um, we've all experienced that and that can be also quite painful. So we know the pain points of how difficult um, change can be. So what do we do about it? So what are the five principles of change management? And I don't think the five I've outlined here really, in, you know, individually, you know, in the way we work is new information, right? Some of it's fairly common sense. Clear communication, we always talk about communication for developers, for UX, and account management, for project managers, for it's a really important way of, uh, it's a really important piece of how we work together. So, um, in terms of change management, the communication is especially important in understanding who we are talking to, understanding who the change is for, understanding and communicating how it changes what they're doing now, how does it make it better, and, and the other important piece is how does it make what they're doing harder? So an example, if you're implementing a new reporting tool, okay, you need to be able to communicate, this is the benefit, this is what it's going to do better for you from what you're doing now. And you may have different levels of report writers. But the other piece that's really important is being able to explain to them what is going to make it harder. And I think that's a message we have, a, we have difficulties ha having with our stakeholders. We always want to kind of message, this is going to change your lives. This is going to be really awesome. This is a great tool. It's going to save you time. It's going to save you money. But we never really get into, well, you know that thing that you used to do where you used to get these reports on this data? you're not going to be able to get that anymore. Or you know how you'd be able to customize certain things? You're not going to be able to, you, we don't have those conversations. That's why change um, can be very difficult to embrace and that's why the communication around what is good as well as bad um, is key in change management. The other key piece is creating accountability. So, I, this um, was part of a, one of the presentations on the session that I attended and um, really spoke to me the most more four words a leader can say, I screw that up. Okay. Um, you know, I think I've worked for so many organizations where there's more uh, CYA, so where you want to, if something goes wrong and, or if something could go wrong, you really don't want to talk about it and you really don't want to own up to it and most people don't. But really, accountability means you not only just, um, not just taking credit, but when something goes wrong, taking responsibility for it, being held accountable for it. And that is especially important in change management. You have to understand the risk and you have to be able to, um, you have to really be able to take responsibility for things that can go uh, wrong as well as the good and the bad in all things. 
the other part um, of one of the sessions I attended talked about you know so many big disaster in our history and some common threats and really one of the uh, one of the things that they pointed out was um, the inability or unwillingness of participants and leaders to raise questions about their concerns and anyone have experiences in this in a, in a project where you felt like you could see you could see the Titanic sinking. You could see the ship sinking. You can kind of see it, but you were hesitant to raise your hand or to escalate or, yeah? There is never time to do it right and always time to do it over. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, and my experience with this has been where, um, you know, there may be a willingness of participants to very openly talk about, hey, we have some big concerns you know, amongst project managers or with VAs or with amongst developers to say, hey, we have real concerns about this timeline or, these, or the functionality um, or these requirements, but it doesn't get escalated to the people who make the big decisions. Or even when it gets escalated, you have leaders who choose not to hear or listen, or again, just take the approach of, we'll fix it later, right? So in change management, uh, one of the key things is there's a, again, the communication piece, accountability piece, is very critical to a successful change management process. So the other part um, is considering your culture. Um, is it closed door? Is it open door? How do people interact? Um, is it mostly by email? Are there like small group conversations happening? Are there town hall meetings? Um, and um, measurement, measuring your success really need to make sure that um, in, any, um, in any change management implementation, um, there has to be a way to measure whether it was done effectively. Now, um, this one I had a lot of questions on. How do you measure the ROI on change management, right? On a project, if you're a project manager, you start with a budget, right? And you, if you come on budget, if you go below budget, then you're good, right? Change management is a little bit different because it's more about how well the people um, accept the change that was happening, right? It's more, it's less, uh, it's hard to quantify. So um, one of the suggestions made or consistently made uh, in all of the session was to do surveys. Surveys with employees, if it was a change within an organization. Surveys with your customers, if it's a product that you released um, externally. And I thought that would be, that, that, that was really helpful. Pacing yourself. Um, change, again, is very difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult process for many people. And it's really important to um, acknowledge that change management doesn't necessarily, isn't a consideration at the end of a project. It's something that has to be considered from the very beginning with the right strategy, the right plan, and the right communication piece to make sure it's, uh, it's fully integrated to the full life cycle of a project. Okay. So the next so with everything I've talked about in terms of the guiding principles of change management, what are some key ingredients of you know, uh, successful change management, uh, what, percentage, what percentage of change management initiatives fail or I guess you could look at it the other way, what percentage would be successful with knowing all of the guiding principles? Any guesses? I'll take a guess. Sure. 90% of businesses fail, so I would say 90%. That's a good guess. Any others? No? Well, 
It is more optimistic than my neighbors said. <laughs> 70% though, and that's still a fairly high number. So we're talking about change initiatives that fail and um, studies show the main factors for the failure related to people. Okay? We, like we talked about, there's a resistance to change. And the conference had, again, um, the whole neuroscience behind change, how we're kind of hardwired to resist change. We're set up to really accept routine. And so when we, bring, when we introduce change, like physiologically, there's an immediate resistance. So there's a resistance to change. And then there's management, uh, kind of not being aligned to change. The message may be they want the change, they want the organization to change, they want this new product deployed, but their behavior shows the opposite. There's a big people factor to why these initiatives fail. And then the other factors, um, inadequate budget or resources, we've all experienced that. And there are other obstacles. Uh, I was thinking, what are some other obstacles? You know, usually I run into like resourcing and budget changes, but any thoughts? What might be the other obstacles? Yeah, so this is uh, kind of makes me think of a project that I was on a few years ago with a manufacturing company mm. and uh, building some software for them. They were on old Lotus Note systems that were built in the 90s and they worked and every time they tried to have an initiative to change them and upgrade them and actually put them on integrated software, the resistance was so strong they just yeah. gave up completely and said, no, we're just going to let you keep doing this. Well, technology has changed enough in the last 20 plus years <laughs> that um, the web servers no longer support the databases and the infrastructure of these old Lotus Notes applications that they were using. And they have 50 different disparate Lotus Notes applications and none of them talk to each other. And, you know, we're talking manufacturing, engineers, people who are working on line assemblies, things like that. And they were relying so much still on paper processes because these lowest note systems weren't talking to each other. So they had tried and tried and eventually it, it came down like there was nothing else. They had to, they had to have a, a cut over. Like they, the yeah. infrastructure no longer could support it. It had to happen. They brought me in as the person to explain to everybody that this has to happen. <laughs> and um, it was really hard. Um, and talking to particularly some of these engineers who were really smart, talented, competent people, um, you know, working on these assemblies and, you know, testing new things that have never been done and innovation um, and trying to get them to see how this was going to benefit them. It was a huge struggle. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it did come down from, you know, upper leadership. You're changing. Like, at this point, you've had enough time to try to join us, to try to collaborate, to try to get us time to build something that would be meet your needs best, but now that we are going to build this as quick and dirty as possible and there's a cutoff. And, and so that was really difficult to manage. So one of the other obstacles that I, that I was thinking of in this slide um, was the processes. So the physical process changes. So the process change management. So the um, the dev director, the managers were just saying, oh, well, it's just up to the managers to figure out how they're going to change the process. It's just up to the managers. Work, focus on the software, focus on what needs to be done, recreate as best we can what they're currently doing, and then let the managers figure it out. And when I would have these requirements gathering sessions and solutioning sessions with the managers, they would come back and say, well, how are they, how? It kept coming back to that, but how are they physically supposed to be doing this? How are we going to, this yep. is going to have to change the way that this happens on the line. This is going to have to change when things occur in the process. Um, there's going to be more data entry. They're going to have to have a terminal to go and type, manually type things in that for people who currently don't interface with terminals, things like that. So um, I did spend a percentage of portion of my time working with those managers and, and throughout the solution and then in the end working on training and working on things that made sense so that when the products were released and we just slowly released them, but when they were released, they knew what to expect at least. 
and they knew there were going to be some issues and it was going to be a big change and that they didn't really have a choice. But at least they knew how their processes, their physical processes in their job were going to change in addition to their interface with the software and the systems that they were used to. So, that's, anyway. Yeah, no, that's other, a really great other point. Obstacles, other things no, I mean, that's a really great point. Um, but, you know, um, so in any big initiative, uh, any big change initiatives, you know, I think the expectation is there's going to be some resistance, right? Uh, one of the key things that I learned um, at this conference is that it's really important to engage executive sponsorship. It's a very much, change management isn't like about grassroots change, you know, we all love those, but it's not just about, you know, we're, it really does, you need the a full spectrum of all of the stakeholders engaged in the change. So maybe the message, like Celestia talked about, all right, comes from the executive, we have to change, okay? And all of the details that she's talked about that goes to the different individual, all of the details about how it's going to change, what will change, what will be good or bad, that, all of that detail is also really important for, for the change uh, to be successfully implemented. Um, and when I say successfully implemented, in her case, that change was coming, one, right? But you have, you could have the, if without the, um, the communication that went with it, or without the executive sponsorship, could be a lot of confusion around the change. You could have, be left with a lot of disgruntled employees, um, and it could really slow down production. So there's a, there's a very negative impact if that change is not managed well. Um, so with that, um, talking about the people factor, sometimes we can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or our identity. I think this is really important in understanding um, when we introduce change to, to our groups and part of it is that if I've always been performing this task a certain way, that's part of my job and my identity. And sometimes when introducing change, that can really threaten my identity, my role, my position, and so forth. So a really successful or well-managed, uh, well-run change management processes is really important. You need to really understand how we accept change and what we're more likely to respond to. So, um, this is what, um, again, what it looks like when we don't consider change management in our processes, in our projects, in our product development. So, we may have a really strong project management group and we focus on deployment and activation and you know we have budgets and timeline and that um, can be achieved really well. As far as change, uh, if we're looking at adoption, like we talked about people embracing that change that's happening, if we're talking about successful change management in terms of proficiency, meaning that it doesn't lower productivity amongst employees. It doesn't lower sales among customers because people are confused about what has changed. Um, if we don't implement successful change management, you have these, uh, you suffer these uh, consequences of low adoption and low proficiency, low productivity. So. So let's move on to, with that, that's kind of a good lead into PMO and CMO. Now when they first talked about CMO because of my marketing background, I thought, chief marketing officer? <laughs> but CMO, there's actually, there are companies with change management offices, just like project management offices. And that was kind of a, that was enlightening news for me, that there could be both offices within an organization. So. Why do we need both PMO and CMO? Any guesses on what the correct answer? We don't need both. PMO's focus on delivery and CMO's focus on adoption, or they should be centralized. B? Yes. Yes. So I said yes to both. 
So, um, so really interesting, um, PMO and CMO, the, the difference is that the project managers focus on the delivery and then change managers focus on the adoption, right? How well that change is communicated and, uh, and um, follow through at the end of the delivery, right? Um, as far as the PMO and CMO, it really depends on the organization. Some organizations are initiating products or they are they're delivering products that are big changes within the industry at such a fast pace, they need both, right? Or, um, or they are centralized, meaning PMOs and CMOs are, are one group. So it really depends on where you are at in this. But uh, if we were to get very specific about the differences, um, the PMO is really about the product, right? And when they first introduced this slide, I had, as a project manager, I always thought, no, it's always about the people, right? I always think it's about the people, the processes, and tools. You know, you guys are, any project manager kind of familiar with that triangle and the operation kind of brings everything together. So that's always been my philosophy. But truly, actually, it's at the end of the day, I am not necessarily, it's while it takes people, process, and technology for a successful pro project, I'm still focused on the end delivery of that product, right? That it meets the requirements, that it meets timelines or deadlines, and it meets budget, right? I'm not necessarily thinking about, um, hey, what is going to happen to this product once it's released to the market, right? How are people going to be using it? Or, um, or internally, you know, how are, uh, how will, you know, my coworkers respond to how their jobs will change? Not necessarily thinking in those terms. So, with the change management office, that is what they're focused on, is really about the people. Um, one of the key things is um, the readiness assessment. Are people ready for this change? And they're also assessing um, management's response and support for the change and um, and they're also implementing change management methodology and tools. Now I know I said that I wouldn't be able to get into specifics of the change management methodology and tools but there's a lot of really great resources available and um, and uh, you know maybe in a year after more webinars on change management, you know, I'll be able to speak more uh, with more expertise on the methodology and tools, but because um, they are slightly different than what we use as project managers. But again, you know, what I'm starting to focus on are the guiding principles of change management um, and slightly different focus. Let, while we're focused on the product, we're also focused on how people are going to accept the change and, um, and adopt um, the change to their everyday work or to how they interact with the product itself. Okay. So, um, this was really helpful in understanding how to do initial assessment on um, bringing in change management to your specific project or, or, an, or at an organizational level. So, some questions that we can start with um, with your team or individually? Does your business have a clear vision? Um, how much of the project's success depends on the employee's willingness and ability to change? And how did you or your employees handle the change last time you were asked to make a change? That's also really important, understanding the history behind it. And what are the expected business outcomes for this project? So some really good questions um, to, to start asking um, before and throughout um, the, uh, the change initiatives, whether it's project-based or organizational-based. Okay? So, I uh, want to spend a few minutes on talking about um, change management in real life. So, I attended a couple of different sessions, one held by Southwest Airlines, another by Whole Foods. Both of these organizations actually have very strong centralized change management offices. They have a project management office and they have a CMO office, or a CMO, 
uh, change management office. And when I talk about the office, we're talking about they have an executive change management officer, okay, which is a new title I've not heard about. And they have a full team to support them. They are not IT, they're not HR, they're not project manager, they're their own separate office. And that was really impressive. And they went through the full evolution of how they got to that point. But as you can imagine, Southwest Airlines and Whole Foods are big enterprises constantly embracing change and looking for change in how they deliver to their customers. So it was really important for these organizations to, um, to build those offices. And they, had a, they recognized the need and they made it happen. Um, so Southwest Airlines, um, this is less technology based, but I really thought that this was um, a really good illustration of how difficult change can be and what, what things you know, employees or we can resist and how they solve that problem. So Southwest Airlines is just growing, right? They're, you know, they're offering, they're, um, they're buying more planes, they're um, offering more routes, and so um, they had a need to, uh, to build a new space, right? They were outgrowing their space and they, had, they shared pictures of their old space, which was amazing. There's a ton of history around it. They had employee photos, employee family photos as well. So there's a lot of nostalgia. You know, there was a lot of involvement in terms of how that old building was designed. So, but they, got the, but they needed the new building they introduced the design of the new building and there was a bit of a freak out. Number one thing that people, and they were concerned about all the photos going away, some of the nostalgia, the history maybe that be, was being replaced, but the biggest obstacle was that they were doing away with offices. So is that, remember, uh, this happened a few years ago, that fad with the open concept so we don't have offices anymore. We have these uh, pods where people can do individual calls. And so what it did was um, there was a lot of resistance from the employees, even the people who didn't have offices, because for them it was a big perk. They're going to work up to getting an office someday. So you can imagine, and the people who had offices, you know, the managers, they really felt like this was something that they really earn, so they were take something away that was very, very important for them. So, uh, so they had a lot of um, change, communication management that had to go around the, the introduction of the new building, and they really had to bring the employees in together by different groups to really explain uh, why this change was happening and how some ways it would improve their lives and how some ways they could make things difficult. Now, the full design of the building couldn't change, of course, because they've gone too far down, right? But they did, um, they did try to, they took the, they heard their employees, they explained, but they were able to accommodate some of the concerns that they had about the new building space. So some of the history that was going away, they were to find space so they could put up those pictures up again as far as the offices. Um, that was something that they could not change, but um, they made sure that um, having offices was not the appropriate way to bring recognition, right? It wasn't a status thing anymore. There were other ways of, um, of recognizing status or, um, or seniority within the company without the offices. So they were able to really address some of those concerns and implement this change. And when they show the new building, it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and so, and this was the entire change management group that managed all that. Um, and with Whole Foods, so this was a different challenge. As we all know, they got acquired by Amazon. But before that happened, it was a big secret. So they have a change management group who had to prepare for this change, had to prepare the employees for this change, but they couldn't talk about it. So it was only known for like a handful of people. So how do they prepare, um, you know, thousands across the globe for this change, but without being able to send out memos, hey, wait, you know, Amazon's taking over, <laughs> um, and same with Amazon. So 
one of the things, uh, one of the major technologies, uh, so it was, a, it was a global change, but one of the main technologies I had to change was their reporting feature. So Whole Foods would get all this data on um, who was buying what, right? You know, they scan everything, it's like, there's no privacy, it's just like, they know what you, you know, they know that you bought, you know, that gluten-free <laughs> cupcake or whatever. And what they had to do was um, merge that technology with Amazon's. So that was a big endeavor. But the main change would be the people who are collecting all of that data, it would be switching over just a very short period of time. So that was a major change that, um, that they um, really had challenges in, and mainly because communication is such a big part piece of change management, and they couldn't really talk about it. So what they did was, he said, you know, it's impossible to not tell anyone that as if nothing is going to happen. So they got the executives to fully talk about some changes to the technology. So they communicated what they could, everything that they could without jeopardizing this big um, acquisition or merger. So, um, so they understood that this was an important piece and while it was a major change that was a secret and you want to announce as much, give people as much detail as possible, they provided um, what they could in pieces and consistently so that when it came, it was still difficult. It wasn't, um, there wasn't a, you know, big riot around, around joining Amazon. I thought that was a, Whole Foods and Amazon was kind of a strange marriage, I thought, but anyway. <laughs> um, let's see, any questions? Any questions on Universal Studio? Yeah, go ahead. Um, change costs, takes time and money. Mm -hmm, definitely. There has to be a reward for changing or a cost for not changing. In my case, I, I'm still running Windows 7 because Windows 10 doesn't offer me anything and it will cost me thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours to upgrade apps and rewrite them right. to do the change. So there's no point in changing until next January when they stop patching it and I have to change. Yes. But there's no reward. It's only until the cost is bad enough that I would change. So that's an example of a failed upgrade in my case. Yeah, and in, you know, with the upgrades, those are really challenging because you know, you, um, most of us really only see some of those down, there's a lot of downsides to, to the upgrade until you absolutely have to, right? Because like you pointed out, um, you don't see as much of the value of the upgrade, you just see all the cost and time, right, that goes into it. And then there will inevitably be another upgrade, right? So you just keep going until, um, until you absolutely are are forced to. So. so I have to wonder if some of the failed changes are because there's no compelling reason for the users to change. Yeah. We're going to change this. Why? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't do anything for me. It's like the uh, seat change. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think, you know, we have to really understand um, there has to be something that there's a, of a big value or benefit to us uh, for the change. But it may be um, if you're in a different role, role right? Um, you really want the change, right? Because you, you see that it's not going to be supported three years from now or something like that, right? And you want to start initiating the change now. So or it's inevitable it's going to, yeah. 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 Or maybe it's um, to encourage, you know, if, you, if you're trying to uh, recruit and, um, and if you're trying to recruit certain talent that may be more um, attracted to newer technology, right? And they come and interview and they're like, wow, you're running that? I don't necessarily want to work for a company that's running, you know, old, old software or application. So there's some other reasons that may, you know, that may get the executives start thinking like, hey, for recruiting purposes, we really want the best, right? We want the best systems, we want the best space to offer our, uh, the people who want to work here to know, for them to 
understand this is a good place to be, right? We're tech savvy or whatever. So that's another angle as well. So. But yeah, the rewards has to be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for and like I said, it really depends on what what position you're at. If you're the person responsible for doing all of the upgrades. You may think, this is just a lot of hours for me. I don't really see the value in it. But it may be where if you were to look at it as, well, I have to do it at some point. I can, I can have three years to do, you know, do this over time, or I can do it in six months when they just quit, stop supporting it, or something like that. I, I'm on a project where I'm faced with this issue, where we have an upgrade, and it has to happen by 2020, and we try to initiate the change last year, Still not happening this year. <laughs> so it's really happening in 2020. And it's very stressful for people responsible for the upgrade because there's so many unknowns with this upgrade, right? They have to set up a whole new dev environment. That takes time. And the tech support from the, uh, from the vendor is a little spotty, right? So they want as much time as possible in implementing it. But, um, but you know, it's about the dollars. Right. Do we spend the money now or next year? So part of it is a developer business issue. You have to keep adding features and mm -hmm. people that upgrade. Yeah. People only use eighty percent of the features and so you wind up adding features that don't matter or like the ribbon menus from the board make things worse. Yeah. And so it's like they're forcing change without this for business reason, just to upgrade. Yeah. From a software perspective, I, I think you know most of us here are in the industry of software in one way or another, and so I think it's definitely something to keep in mind um, and to think about throughout the process. Whether you know you're the project manager, whether you're the VA, whether you're the developer, whether you're the QA, you know throughout the entire process, that whole um, development team and everybody responsible for that software initiative, whatever it is, should be at some point thinking of the end user and what happens after this is released and if you think of something then say something you know bring it up if it's QA bring it up to somebody on the team bring it up to whoever is doing the requirements bring it up to the business you know just have that open communication it's really important to think about and it's something that I have to think about a lot in my role um, and really think about change management as yeah. an after effect of, because the business and the business users who I'm interacting with and I'm working as that liaison of branch staff business and technology and the business is think, definitely thinking about well how is my team going to do this or yeah. when I'm gathering requirements from somebody who's you know, working in manufacturing or working in a call center and they're going to be the main consumers of the system and they're going to have to be using it every day, you know, while I'm gathering those requirements, while I'm figuring out a solution, you know, really thinking of how this is going to affect them and what it will look like down the line. Yep. So I think it's definitely really important. I think it's cool to know that you went to this conference and there's a whole change management office, you know, concept. It's really cool. There's a Utah chapter. Yeah. <laughs> I think there were like three people seated at the table, but yeah. you know it is exciting, and it's exciting. I mean, especially if you're, you know, in, um, I think it's important for like all of our roles to understand. But um, you know, if you're if you're a business analyst or a project manager, it's definitely another layer in in your um, in your professional, I guess, path um, to consider. That's um, you know that's. And possibly more interesting, you know, and more engagement with people. Um, but yeah, I mean, Celestia, you bring up a really good point. Like for developers, as they're developing, I think they have, um, they're probably the closest to understanding how this product will change, right, um, with any enhancement work. And um, would probably be the best to, um, to be able to say, hey, if we're thinking in terms of change management, this is really going to change. If I do this, that person will no longer be able to do what they really enjoy doing. And this has to be communicated. Um, and I think this is where change management um, can really help um, support that kind of communication within an organization or any kind of project or development process. So, Any other questions? Okay. Thanks so much for your time. Hope you enjoy the lunch.